All right, we're going to finish up our, we started four weeks ago uh, looking at letter, Paul's letter to the Philippians. And uh, the question was, what can we learn from reading someone else's mail, right? This is a letter written 2,000 years ago to a faraway place to people we'll never meet. Uh, the thing is, I think we can actually learn quite a bit. Uh, circumstances maybe are quite different from people who lived in Philippi for us, but human nature is very much the same. Um, Remember a couple weeks ago, Paul was urging us to, uh, in, in the letter he wrote, he says, be of one mind and be of the mind of, of Jesus. Do what Jesus would do, right? That's what, he was, what his main focus is in, in this letter. Now he comes back and at the end of the letter, revisits that theme again, and he calls out two women leaders of that faith community. Their names were Iodia and Syntyche. Now, Philippia, uh, Philippi was different than a lot of the other areas that Paul visited. Uh, in Philippi, women had a much more public role uh, than in it, other parts of, of, uh, of that Mediterranean. Like in Cor when Paul writes to the people in Corinth, he says, women, uh, be silent. In that culture, in that time in Corinth, there was a different kind of a, of a world that they were living in. But Philippi has a whole different, a whole different ball game, all right? Um, when, fall, when Paul first comes to Philippi, uh, he was seeking, you know, people of faith. He says, where do I go to find people of faith? He goes to the river, and who does he find at the river? Women. Women who had come, women who were worshiping. And one of those women, his name was Lydia. Uh, and she was a businesswoman. Uh, she becomes the first to be baptized along with her whole household and, and, uh, and hosts the, this, this faith community in her home. Um, so women played a very significant role in the life of the church in Philippi. But with power comes responsibility, and as leaders, they're called to a certain, uh, to be an example. So Paul calls out these two women in the congregation, Odia and Syntyche, um, and he writes this. He says, um, I urge Odia, I urge Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, to help these women for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Now Paul goes on with probably, probably the best known passage of, or part of this letter, sort of the key, I believe, for knowing the mind of Christ. And he goes on, he says this, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say, rejoice let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Powerful words. The source of joy is a relationship with Jesus where we don't worry, where we lift up our concerns to God and we experience peace. One of the most influential writers in my faith journey is someone called C.S. Lewis. Are you familiar with C.S. Lewis? Has anyone read C.S. Lewis? Some of you, some of you have. Um, uh, many are, know, are, know him because of his uh, children's series. Right? It's called The Chronicles of, of Narnia, which I didn't discover until I was in college. Uh, but it's some of the most creative and imaginative exploration of faith that I've, I've ever seen, you know. And uh, if you haven't read that, uh, if you like fantasy, you know, it, it's just powerful, powerful images. But they're also the classics. Uh, the, the one that, uh, in, that, I, uh, that probably shaped me the most is a book called Mere Christianity. Or uh, the other one I love is, is called The Screwtape Letters. So he's written uh, prolifically about this journey of faith. But he didn't start out as a Christian theologian, right? He was a professor of medieval and Renaissance literature at Cambridge. Um, and for a significant part of his life, he was an atheist. But he talks about this journey he makes from, from being an atheist, uh, a, a scholar, uh, to, uh, to faith. And the book is called Surprised by Joy. And I think... Uh, if, if we, if you, this book really helps, helps me as I understand what Paul is talking about when he's talking about rejoicing in the Lord. Now, C.S. Lewis's parents were not particularly religious. 
Uh, and his mom died when they were relatively young, which really put him into a tailspin. Uh, he was sent off to a boarding school, which was not a good experience for him. He ended up rejecting religion, says, I just don't believe in God. But he said there must be something that gives purpose and meaning to life. He could remember there were times where he felt uh, in his early life where he felt connected, where he felt whole, where everything was good. And, and uh, he says that he, there was a deep longing for that experience in his life, and he called this thing joy. Now he says that's different. Joy is different than happiness. It's different than simply having pleasure. It's something more transcendent, uh, something that completes us, something that gives, has a profound sense of harmony in our life. So Lewis spent his life trying to find that experience of joy. So he, he dove in and read great literature and listened to incredible music. He went out and enjoyed the beauty of creation. And uh, while these things were pleasurable, while these things brought happiness to him, they didn't, he didn't find in them the joy he was seeking. And he realized these were simply vehicles uh, that carried joy, but they were not the source of joy. And so that took him on a deeper search for the source of joy. And he used the same critical eye that he had used uh, to examine all his assumptions, uh, and he found that his atheism was based on certain beliefs as well. And he says, what is it that I'm going to choose to believe? And he re-examined Christianity. Apart from the strict literalism, he says there, and he realized there was, there was power there. And he was surprised by joy. He found purpose, meaning, without having to sacrifice his intellect. Now each of us make our own, make our own journeys. Each of us have to do the same kind of thing to find what is it that's going to provide meaning and purpose in our life. Is that which we can be a source of joy for us? Let me go back to Paul and his letter. Paul writes this. He says, finally, beloved, whatever's true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things you've learned and received and heard and seen in me. The God of peace will be with you. I think Paul's reminding them, uh, sort of like the journey C.S. Lewis went on, to examine your life, test the assumptions, ask hard questions. It's worth the effort to have a faith that will carry you through these difficult times. A peace that passes understanding is not the absence of conflict or, or negative circumstances. That kind of peace is the presence of joy. It's the presence of God. Well, Paul wraps up his letter, um, coming back to this theme of joy again. He says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly, and now at last you've revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me, but you had no opportunity to show it. Not that I'm referring to being in need, for I've learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little. I know what it is to have plenty. In any, and all, in any and all circumstances, I've learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. And I can do all things through him who strengthens me. For Paul, there is a connection between an experience of joy and learning to be content. Neither one comes as a result of our efforts, but through an experience of grace we experience contentment. We can experience joy. Paul's content, but he's also thankful, right? And he gives thanks for those who made sacrifices for his well-being. So he, he writes this. He says, In any case, it was kind of you to share my distress. You Philippians know indeed that in the early days of the gospel when I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. Even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent help for my needs more than once. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the profit that accumulates to your account. I've been paid in full, and I have more than enough. 
I'm fully satisfied, and now that I've received from Ephroditus the gifts that you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And God will fully satisfy every need of yours according to the rich, his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To God our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The friends who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of the emperor's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. And that's how he ends up his letter. Let's get our musicians back up here. Um, there's a song that we introduced. If you were at the second service last week, we introduced it to you. If not, this might be a new one for you. Uh, but it simply comes, takes the text right out of his letter to the Philippians, talking about rejoicing in the Lord always. <laughs> 